Welcome to the question hour, our live Q&A session with Mr. Sunil Subramaniam, MD of Sundaram Mutual. The question hour will answer questions on the economy, stock markets, and mutual funds, all of these posed by you, our listeners. We've got several questions to answer, sir. So let's get to it. Thank you, Shweta. And uh, welcome to the 12th uh, version of our question hour. Uh, as Shweta mentioned, we've been inundated with questions. So she has made an attempt to put them and group them together uh, because we have more than 100 questions. So obviously, one by one, it'll be difficult, but she's grouping them together by category so that we'll try and address most of the queries that have come up. So you can start now, Shweta. The first question, sir. Inflation numbers are currently seen as a big headwind macro. Would you agree? And if yes, how far could the market get dragged down because of inflation? Yes, I do agree that uh, inflation is a headwind. But before we uh, try to evaluate the system of the markets, uh, let's look at it from uh, multiple slicing and dicing. It's a very interesting question, so it takes time to a bit of answer. So there is two things, right? Uh, the Indian market is essentially a function of liquidity, right? The markets have been rising, ignoring the corona wave, ignoring the pandemic, ignoring the lockdowns and going up because there is massive liquidity, both from outside India, from the G4 central banks, and from India, from the Reserve Bank pumping in liquidity. So the effect of inflation on liquidity is a key element for the markets, because the inflation has an effect on the economy, which is on the companies. Inflation has effect on the retail person through petrol prices and you know uh, his uh, costs going up. But if you look at it from a, a market's perspective, the two factors then are, is the inflation headwind going to affect liquidity? And second, is the inflation headwind going to affect the economy, i.e. the EPS of market participants, right? These two things. Now, when you look at the inflation uh, of liquidity con connection, right? Uh, abroad, the United States of America, which is roughly accounts for half of the FBI flows into the world, the inflationary concerns uh, which are rising in the United States. Currently, the Federal Reserve is saying that they see this rise in inflation as a temporary one. So they don't see a need to alter their liquidity pumping soft interest rate policy right now. However, if they are proved to be wrong, because the data visit comes out, right, could very well prove Fed to be wrong. So I think Fed is just giving their read of the situation they're also attempting to calm the markets. So if the US economy's growth goes faster than expected, then inflation could rise faster, and hence the Fed could very well change its stance. And in a rising inflation scenario, two things happen. The Fed will do uh, pause their rate cutting. They may think of rate hikes. Two, they will pull back the liquidity. And third is that the dollar will start to strengthen because of the US economy strengthening. All of these are negative for liquidity. So a combination of inflation with a strong dollar will mean that imported prices for Indian economy like oil and other commodities will go up, number one. Number two is that metals plus oil price rises will come as imported inflation and RBI's expectation of inflation right, will get exceeded. And hence, RBI may also pull back its liquidity, which is negative for the markets. At the same time, uh, sectors in India, like paints, like automobiles, which use a lot of imported components, including crude, their input costs will rise. And if they are not able to pass it on to the public because the economy is still in a lockdown, then their EPS could suffer, and hence the market valuations could correct. So your question in terms of inflationary headwinds, can it have an impact on the market? Yes. The question is two things. One, is the inflation hike temporary as the Fed currently feels, or is it a sustained rise? That is the expected inflation three months, six months down the road. How does it look? And second is definitely if that is going on a strength, you can expect some degree of correction. The counter to a correction is the fact that there are long-term FIIs who may not necessarily react to these inflation-related liquidity moves, but continue investing in India because of its long-term growth prospects. So that will cushion the fall. Second is Indian market has seen a wider domestic participation. Retail investors have been consistently post-pandemic directly buying stocks 
they are called robin hood investors because the number of dmat accounts has gone up so they are providing liquidity in a broad based sense to the market and mutual funds which last year were forced to sell because investors were pulling out this year investors have come back to mutual funds by reducing their redemptions and increasing their purchases so mutual funds have also started buying so domestic insurance companies like lic mutual funds plus retail investors will be able to absorb some of the selling by short term fis so while there will be some amount of correction it may not be as strong a correction as was seen the last time tapering of liquidity occurred in may 2013 almost 8 years ago right at that time there was a severe reaction by the market to the tapering this time the market is half prepared there is liquidity going around so the correction of i would estimate from my between 5 to 15 percent is what you can expect in the larger cap segments because that's where fis mostly play in the markets so so i hope that detailed answer uh, covered your uh, question the next question sir if india faces negative growth and inflation together should the fiscal and monetary policies be expansionary or restrictive so india facing negative growth is far from a reality because the indian economy has a sustainable growth rate you saw that the lockdown complete lockdown led to a 24% negative gdp growth for the quarter the very next quarter it retraced ground and this latest quarters it has already posted positive so for india it's a short term shock impact of a black swan event which led to that quarter an artificial shutdown of the economy otherwise the indian economy is normally a 6 to 8 percent gdp growth sustainable gdp growth economy in normal circumstances so the question of negative gdp growth i would say is fairly uh, very low but in situations such as these definitely an expansionary monetary policy is justified because if there's a short term negative then you have to revive demand at all costs and that can happen only through an expansionary policy whether that's done by the reserve bank through liquidity or the government through direct spending which is called the keynesian model right so fiscal plus monetary expansionary policy are definitely uh, needed because india as an economy can sustain a higher rate of inflation than advanced countries so i think uh, definitely in terms of negative gdp growth an expansionary monetary cum fiscal policy is justified uh, next question sir if the market is down due to coronavirus will it start growing once coronavirus is cleared yes but i think that that was the fear last ma last year march march 2020 but you said since then the markets have been roaring they have been on a hot run so i think the markets have never reacted to the corona crisis other than that one month of march subsequently the market has realized that the crisis is here but it's not going to be forever so i think part there are enough long term market participants who look at a short term correction as a buying opportunity to keep buying even through such periods so i think the when the corona virus is finished you will find that there is not that much of a rise maybe some sentimental rise because the market has already discounted a v shaped recovery for india so when that happens it's as per expectations so there will be some amount of you know some people who didn't believe it fully will also start buying so there will be some uptick but do not expect a strong uh, recovery just because corona is in the past because the market has already understood and the, that's why they say the stock market is always a lead indicator of the economy uh, next question sir is now a good time to invest which schemes and funds are best in the current situation so it's never a bad time to invest the key is that the timing of your investment is what you should be deciding right so today the situation is that we have just crossed the second wave right reasonably comfortably we know a third wave is definitely coming we know there's a new delta variant which is coming which could upset the apple cart but that is being countered by a almost doubling of the vaccination rate already we have seen the government do that and they will increase that even more so the government may take about 6 to 9 months to achieve a satisfactory level of complete vaccination of let's say two doses for 70% of the population so 6 to 9 months is a reasonable expectation at the same time the us economy's recovery could give a little bit of a shock to our market due to this inflation i just gave a long explanation on how the inflation connection to our markets could be quite strong so in that sense today 
is not a good time if you have a 12 to 18 month horizon to invest in the stock market because there could be volatility and in 18 months time the market could move sideways could have strong corrections and the like but if you have a perspective of a three to five years right then i would say these 12 to 18 months period is a very good time because of the volatility to acquire mutual fund portfolios or stocks through a systematic approach because volatility is a friend of the SIP investor and volatility is a friend of the long-term investor. So if you are willing to stagger your amounts through SIPs or STPs, parking it in a liquid fund and then shifting it to equity, and if your perspective is three to five years, it is a good time to invest because the volatility will give you the ability to buy lots of good stocks through mutual funds at a very reasonable price and the rupee cost averaging is the term used for that i think so it's a good time to invest the only thing is keep at least a three to five year perspective when you're starting the investment journey now so next one sir uh, we've got this live do you think this is a good time to buy mid cap stocks as large or small caps are expensive in this market I agree with you because what has happened is that the small cap is very concentrated around a few sectors. Small cap companies have got very low floating stock in the market because owners, promoter owners or large institutions hold most of the stock and they don't trade in the market. So there is a very small liquidity available there. And the whole surge in the Robinhood investing, people buying on tips who have a lot of time on hand thanks to the lockdown have been buying into a lot of these stocks. So the stock small cap stocks have risen in anticipation of a huge economic boom, which may take time to come through. Large caps have been supported by FPIs, where the US growth and inflation and dollar strengthening could lead to an impact. So you've correctly identified that small caps and large caps are both today at reasonably good valuations, quite high. Whereas mid caps, having a more diverse portfolio, having more floating stock than small caps, and having a lot of sectoral opportunities, I think that represents a good sweet spot to invest in. So I agree with you that it's a good time to invest in mid caps because as for last data I saw, mid cap index is trading at about 15% discount to the large cap in the indices. So I think it's, yes, it's a good time to uh, invest in a mid cap portfolio. Next one, sir. If I have a three-year horizon, is it a good time to get into mid and small caps now? Expecting same, about same kind of question again. Uh, maybe we can avoid repetitive questions, Shweta. Sure, sir. It's the same uh, thing. Yeah. Should I redeem my funds since the markets are down? Well, uh, you should redeem your funds when you need the money. Forget about whether markets are up or down. If you had a set a goal and that goal is achieved, you should redeem your money. Uh, if you uh, uh, are just a long-term investor, there's no need to redeem your money because the markets will correct maybe sometime, but again, rebound also in some time. So not to worry if you're a long-term investor. So next one, sir. Between flexi caps or mid caps, which do you think will perform better in 21-22? So I would say that 21-22 uh, uh, as a year is uh, almost done. It's half the year is gone. So I think it's very hard to give a short-term prediction to the market. And... Uh, so what I would say is that rather than look at purely in terms of returns, you look at a risk reward perspective, I would say flexi caps would offer a better risk reward return than pure mid caps because mid caps inherently are more volatile, whereas flexi caps will have an allocation to small caps, mid caps and large caps, thereby giving you a better risk reward ratio. Next one, sir. Uh, share markets are continuously moving upwards. How will it impact retailers who still invest in shares and mutual funds for long-term benefits? Is it a good decision to stay away for some time to avoid getting hurt? What do you think the prospects are in the next six months? So next six months, let me reverse your question. Next six months are going to be volatile. But volatility doesn't mean one-way street down. It's not a bad market by any means. Okay, so it's a volatile market means there'll be ups and downs, there'll be ups and downs, some corrections will be severe, some rises will be very sharp also. So as a retail investor for this peak yet, I would suggest that you stagger your investment over in whichever form you choose, right? You can uh, either set up an SIP 
or you can set up an stp which is putting money into debt funds and giving an instruction to switch or you could do your own staggering by let's say you start today and you say that every time there's a correction in the market by let's say three percent i will put in some money right you keep using corrections to buy that is needs a little more time and effort from your side but in these days of internet and quick action i think that is also eminently possible so a retail investor you should continue to stay invested the method of investing should be changed you should adopt a systematic approach for the volatile period and the markets have run up a lot so it's given a lot of paper wealth to people right the feeling good factor because you've been investing and you suddenly see your wealth grow so to that extent i would say that you know should you book profits and stay away i have a simple thumb rule to offer to you right i would say that any time you have tripled your money in a particular portfolio in the last let's say 5 years if you have tripled your money i would say book profits because tripling your money and that's what i would call as a rule of 110 you divide 110 by the number of years it gives you the annualized return that your portfolio has given you on tripling so why i'm saying this is even if your portfolio has tripled in 10 years which means what 110 divided by 10 is 11 which means you got a 11% annualized return on your portfolio and given that the stock market has tax benefits of only 10% taxation i would argue that it's double the return of any fixed deposit post tax basis so even in 10 years your money has tripled your remote is fine but i'm not saying 10 years so let's just reduce this to 3 years or whatever right you take 110 right and divide it by by 3 it means that what you've got 35% per annum return if you divide it by 5 so the point is that i think tripling is a good filter to keep shaving off profits and then reallocating it based on your current view so as a simple thumb rule because the markets have risen a lot i would suggest that as a retail investor unless you have done goal based financial planning based investment in which case don't bother wait for your goals to be achieved but if you have not done that which is not something that i recommend i always every investment should be planned with a goal in mind but in case you have not done that and you just idle money you just parked it simple thumb rule use the rule of 110 to decide on those portfolios where your money has tripled look at the net returns that you've got and i would say book your profits and then that profit can be parked in a liquid fund and you can reinvest it in the stock market through mutual funds through the sip stp stp route and through flexi cap and those kind of funds where the risk reward ratio will be managed by the fund manager in your benefit if you are a little more conservative in approach as a retail investor then i would suggest the hybrid category which is balanced advantage fund dynamic asset allocation funds equity hybrid funds those give a small proportion to debt instruments so that the volatility comes down so that's the strategy i would request retail investors to adopt the uh, next question sir um which are the best mutual funds for senior citizens so i would say that uh, when you say say you are a senior citizen i assume that you have stopped working and that you are now dependent on your corpus of savings through your working lifetime to take care of your expenses for the next few decades because life expectancy as you know in india is in the mid 70s today so uh, the the middle class and all should live longer so in planning for that right what i would say is that first of all if you are let's say i take 60 i would say you can do the math you can just do 100 minus 60 so 100 minus your age you can put it in equity funds the rest should be in uh, debt uh, liquid funds okay uh, that's one one rule so second aspect is in equities where should you put your money i would still say that there are options like balanced funds which give you debt plus equity and the case of dynamic asset allocation like baf funds the fund manager actually varies that amount based on the market situation so if the market has run up a lot they reduce the equity themselves so as senior citizens i would say a majority of your corpus should go into this hybrid category there are uh, balanced advantage funds there are aggressive hybrid or equity oriented hybrid fund and then there is an equity savings fund so remember that 
the risk reward that they play across the spectrum so they will be able to provide less volatility because as a senior citizen right you are hard earned corpus right you don't want to see it go through so much volatility because then you get worried about the future now that being said right whatever corpus you invest in equity right i would suggest that you set up a systematic withdrawal plan to take care of your monthly expenses now what is the kind of corpus i would say another thumb rule that i would like to uh, advise you as a senior citizen is just multiply your monthly expenses that you anticipate to live a comfortable life by 300 if you multiply let us say that you want 1 lakh a month today to come which means you need a corpus of 3 crores and if you then take out a systematic withdrawal plan put it into a mutual fund and set up a systematic withdrawal plan and withdraw 4% every Four percent every year divided by twelve. That's the amount you draw down from your capital plus appreciation, right? Because automatically the portfolio will be appreciating. So a simple rule of four percent will make sure that for the next twenty-five years, even if there is zero return, right, you would have used up the corpus to live a comfortable life. But that's highly unlikely because four percent as a return overall on the longer term, definitely uh, mutual fund should be able to deliver. So that surplus will make sure that that tenure of twenty five keeps getting extended to maybe thirty or thirty five years. So this simple thumb rule, I would say, will serve you very well. So uh, next question, sir. For how long will the small cap rally continue? When is the next bottom? Is it a cycle? uh i'll again answer my questions and answer your question in reverse yes it is a cycle how long will the rally will continue the current rally was fueled by two things uh, a entry of a large number of first time investors called robin hood investors through demat accounts directly buying into the stocks of small caps based on broker recommendations their research and all of that that is one trend the second trend is mutual funds which easily buy from a 3 to 5 year perspective trying to provide a balance between large bid and small and hence buying small caps the third and the reason which i alluded to earlier is that the liquidity being very less even the small amount of buying has led to a sharp increase in prices so today the forward valuations of small cap are akin to that of the large cap index right which means that the earnings growth expectation is roughly similar now in the case of the small cap since i said it's a cycle this expected earnings will come on the back of an infrastructure growth so the budget gave a infrastructure thrust the government has been inviting fdi through the pli schemes and reduced taxation to support the growth so today it is the anticipation of that growth coming through to india which has taken up the small cap stocks and the indices now will this rally sustain so it depends on how quickly we are able to control the third wave and come out of it and give that heft to the long term growth of india which is certain india's potential is uh, uh, certain the long term growth the problem is that we don't know when it can actually happen the if is not in question so there will be a day when it comes when suddenly some news will come which says that this process is going to get delayed like maybe when the budget time comes and india's fiscal deficit comes out worse than expected there could be a feeling that the government's resources are constrained and infrastructure may not get the push that was earlier expected many such news flows and events can occur which could bring this cycle down temporarily but in the long run over the next 3 to 5 years the actual reality that these things can't get delayed because government has initiated actions on reforms on pli on on uh, income tax on 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 uh, all of these things which will give a definite thrust to it so again after a correction there will be a rise now the point is that since we cannot time the correction correctly right when should you exit then two things are there one i said the 3x rule right so if your money has tripled and you have invested only the last let's say 3 to 4 years back and your money has tripled you have made a very healthy return you can book profits and come back to it when that correction happens second if you are a long enough term investor then just don't worry keep investing systematically so that any correction happens you will be buying more and more units at that time so depending on the time frame of your outlook and your approach on your how conservative in terms of risk approach you are you can adopt either of these two strategies so next question sir given that 
uh, millions are jobless because of the pandemic. Uh, do we see like a major stock market correction happening? Not at all. See, the millions of job losses are largely in the unorganized sector, the non-formal sector, and the low-end wage owner. Now, that's something for India as an economy to worry about because of the joblessness and the politicians to worry about because their winning of elections is related to that. But if you take the stock market companies, which, you know, BSE 500, 500 companies, maybe take another 500, the top 1,000 companies in the country, I don't think that those people have... Uh, their employees or anybody has got affected. The proof of this is the fact that the number of DMAT accounts has gone roaring through the roof. The number of new people entering the stock market has gone up. So I think that there is enough liquidity in the world today from outside of India, from mutual funds, from things, that the stock market is not correlating the current job losses at the lower end of the uh, pyramid right, with any impact on the earnings of Indian corporates listed in the stock market. Indian economy may take a little bit of a hurt because of this, but not the companies in the stock market. So I would not say that any correction in the stock market due to unemployment in India going up is very different from the situation in advanced countries where, you know, unemployment uh, affecting does affect overall demand and all of that. Next question, sir. Given that uh, Indian markets are ahead of earnings, uh, is it time to diversify to other markets around the world? Um, suggest other markets you prefer as NASDAQ is also on a dream run. Uh, yes. So if you are very uh, risk uh, oriented as an investor, diversification across to other markets is a very good option, right? Uh, what is the reason for that? One, like you said, Indian markets have gone up, NASDAQ has also gone up. But the story of the situation is like this. That is, the U.S. economy is going to lead the world in terms of recovery. Now, when the U.S. economy recovers, right, the Nasdaq's earnings, you remember one thing, is that the U.S. stock market is only half dependent on the U.S. economy because most of the companies, the top companies in the U.S. stock market have global operations. So the U.S. stock market reflects the fate of those companies and not necessarily only the U.S. economy. Right. So from a stock market perspective, the reason the Nasdaq and others have risen is because of the expectation that these companies would benefit from a worldwide growth. Right. So from a diversification perspective, right, I think there are two options to go. Right. One is it's hard to choose a country to say this country, because very often Indian markets have risen because Indian future economic growth has been discounted by participants, like you mentioned in your question. Similarly, in the U.S., there are a lot of markets where they may not have happened, but they are very commodity sensitive cyclical markets. So if the commodity rally revives and goes ahead, as in the last one was China led, the future, if it's US led or somewhere, and then, then those markets could do. But you know, these are cyclical and it's very hard to say pick one country. So my suggestion is there one of two options. One is you choose a diversified global fund, which invests across geographies. Now, how does it decide on which country to invest? It must have a proper risk management basis to select those countries, right? That's one. Second is, the other option is, choose in a portfolio where it has global companies in the portfolio who themselves, their operations are diversified across countries. That's an easier task to do because you go and identify a Coca-Cola, uh, Intel, an Apple, uh, uh, McDonald's, uh, BMW, uh, Mercedes. You know, these companies, whichever stock market they are listed in, their businesses are worldwide. So they are going to benefit from the economic recovery. Wherever it happens, even if one is lower, something else will pick up. So you can choose something which chooses global companies based on the diversity of their operations and not country-specific companies, right? So that kind of a fund which Sundaram has called Sundaram Global Brand Fund could be a very good option for you to look at. And the final aspect I would say on why I agree with your thing that global diversification is something value-added is because the Indian currency has recently been appreciating basis on the strong FPI, FDI flows which have come. But any tapering news and anything could lead to a correction. And rather in mind, if you have invested in global portfolios through mutual funds, any currency devaluation of India will come to your aid and hedge you against that risk because you are in India. So it's a very good suggestion that you have given. I support it. Like I said, so international funds, 
globally diversified, either through global companies or through a proper model of choosing countries, will definitely help you both from the growth in the world outside of US and India and from the currency devaluation. The long-term currency trend of India has to be a devaluing currency because interest rate differential, which is at 6% for the government 10-year borrowing and 1.5% the US 10-year borrowing, tells you that that difference of 4.5% has to be made up by the currency. That is the fundamental rule of economics you know, on currency. Right. So a long term depreciation of the rupee is almost, uh, uh, I wouldn't say guaranteed, but to be expected. And mind you that any recovery in the world, if India is to participate, it is through exports and for exports to participate, our currency has to be devalued and kept competitive with our competing countries. So an RBI, which has been preventing it from uh, devaluing too much, will soon shift its stance and allow a gentle in tune with the interest rate devaluation of the rupee. So I think for all of those reasons, global funds are an excellent diversification option at the current point in time. The next question, sir. Do you suggest to redeem index funds and pocket in ultra short term debt funds until there is a correction in the market? Oh, well, like I said, so what are your reasons for investing? See. The point is wealth, paper wealth can vanish. You should have something else to do with your money. Now you want to just make sure that you exit before the bottom and enter before the rise. Right? That's an impossible task. No expert fund manager in the world has been able to do that because there are too many extraneous factors deciding this. So as an investor, how do you then approach it, right? What I would recommend is that you go strictly by goal-based investing. So now you have made some money from index funds. You have the money. Do you have another thing that you would like to do, like buy a car, buy a house, buy some jewelry for your uh, family, or put it in a uh, you know long-term uh, somewhere, you know there's an expense coming up in two years, your ch uh, daughter's marriage or your son is going abroad for education, whatever, you know that, that this amount of money, then in the next 18 months to two years, whatever needs you have, yes, what you suggest is a good strategy to move into an ultra short term and park it there. Now, if you're saying that I'm going to move it now, wait for the correction and re-enter, the point is that yes, definitely there will be a correction and you can re-enter. Right? It's a good situation. But what are you going to then re-enter and do? Right? That's my point. The point I'm trying to stress again is that the goals to which you're using the investment in the stock market, you have to keep sight of that. And don't keep changing those goals. Right? Once you set a goal, act as per that. And anytime in a two-year time frame before the goal, please move it into ultra short term and liquid. That's a very good strategy. But timing the market, saying that I am like God, I know the market is going to correct, I'll pull out. And when the correction happens, at what time of the correction will you enter? 5% correction, 10% correction, 15% correction. After you have a 10% correction, there could be another 5% correction, you'll feel, oh, I should have waited. So this only leads to a lot more confusion in decision making. So I would keep the pole of decision making as linked to goals. And goals doesn't mean long-term things like retirement, uh, uh, like I mentioned, you know, education of your children or no. Goals could be very short term. You could say, post the pandemic, I want to go on a holiday to Switzerland. A holiday to Switzerland cost me 5 lakh of rupees. I invested 2 lakhs, it's become 5 lakhs. Sit is aside. So once you have clarity on what you'll do with the money, right? that's when you should liquidate. So I would suggest that you look at your investment philosophy in the light of the fact that every decision that you take has to be linked to a certain goal. The next one, sir. Um, funds are underperforming. Why? Well, funds are underperforming uh, because the rally has been very polarized. FII's uh, when they decide to invest in the Indian markets, and India has got an undue share of flows of FII compared to other emerging countries, they come to a risky market like India, but within a risky market, they like to buy safety because they don't want the riskiness of the country along with the riskiness of the stocks. It's a double risk, right? So that's why they come to India, they buy FMC, they buy IT, they buy pharma during the COVID pandemic. So what is a safety-oriented portfolio they buy? And they don't have any rules that I can't buy more than this much percentage of this, this, this. Indian fund managers are constrained. One, 
they are supposed to manage diversified portfolio you cannot concentrate in one second there are risk rules right just because something you feel will go up you put most of your money into that tomorrow it goes wrong you are handling millions of investors money because you are not handling your own money it's other people's money so they have to have good risk systems which means that you will not get all of the gains but you will not suffer all of the losses that's a simple principle of diversification so fund managers in a time when the markets have been rising because the fis have been buying a select set could not from a risk management perspective be permitted to just go and buy as much of what they feel they will buy there is a risk management process that what if you are wrong please protect yourself that inherent mandate of a mutual fund fund manager to protect the downside also while trying to give you the upside means that in a time of a strong polarized bull rally as has happened driven by fii's they will definitely underperform but as life returns to normal as fii's as the world returns to normal and india gets a due share of its flows and indian economy shows the thing the fund managers will be able to outperform because fii's don't have the knowledge of the mid caps and the small caps that domestic fund managers have so when the rally turns broad based automatically you will see the return of alpha and the domestic fund managers will be able to beat benchmarks and the pure large cap concentrated funds that uh, stocks that uh, fii's tend to buy so that's the reason for fund managers not beating the benchmark and that's why a lot of people have looked at index funds and putting their money but let me tell you this is not a situation which is going to last forever right there will be a time when alpha will return because once it comes to fundamental based investing and not only choosing a safety oriented approach or whatever then you will see that the fund managers research will come to the aid of making better stock picks than in the index and they be to deliver what is known as alpha the next one sir i have an sip in your organization now i want to invest a lump sum amount in your company through mutual funds which fund is suitable so very broadly you not give me any more details about your risk appetite your age and all of that so i would generally suggest the balanced advantage fund and the blue chip fund blue chip is a large cap diversified fund which will be able to play a narrow broad based rally is the large cap which will be less volatile and the balanced advantage fund which actually varies the amount of equity versus uh, arbitrage and debt so these are the two categories that i would recommend you look at it from a perspective if you are a longer term investor with a 5 to 10 year horizon then our mid cap fund is a good choice for you to make the next question sir Beyond listed entities, does Sundaram provide investment opportunities in innovative and research-based businesses or startups in India? No. Simple answer is no. Our business as a, a mutual fund is just to invest in listed equities only, and oh. uh, neither regulations nor our intention is to invest in non-listed companies. Uh, next one, sir. Um, where? Uh, So, as a retail investor, the last one year, the investment strategy of mutual funds are uh, confused to NFOs versus existing schemes. So, how do we predict what schemes will give better yield among the MCs? How do we know when to go for an NFO? So, I would generally say that uh, NFOs should be avoided. The reason I say this is that. Uh, sebi in march 2018 onwards has introduced something called categorization of mutual funds so they said that each mutual fund can have only one fund in one part of category and in the sectoral funds you can have any number of sectoral options right so when nfos are launched these are generally by amcs filling up the gap or new amcs which have just come up which want to launch it retail investors are very interested in nfos because it's at 10 rupees so they get attracted by the price but bear in mind the price of a uh, mutual fund has nothing to do with the return potential so why do i say generally no to nfos is because in a case of an nfo you're going behind a theme let's say esg which has been a flavor of uh, recent times and hope that the theme will deliver but remember thematics are always cyclical so investing in thematics needs Uh, not only a decision of when to enter but a decision of when to exit and that's where the discipline you should have and so that's one thing in terms of specialty nfos but in general nfos you will find that there are 45 amcs and if one nfo is being launched 
there are 43, 44 other AMCs which probably have that product already. So when you're looking at a category-based NFO, there is enough evidence of past performance over a longer term from existing mutual funds, even if their NAV is at 500 or 600, right? That doesn't determine the potential because you may get lesser number of units, but the value is the same and the growth potential will be the same. So I would say that if you're going for a normal category mutual fund permitted by SEBI, please take a look at the existing and you can invest in an NFO if you feel that that fund house has demonstrated across categories a very reasonable performance and hence they were likely to do that. So the track record of the fund manager overall. But I would still say that for the same category, if you can pull out the list of existing funds, see how they have performed across good cycles and bad cycles. And then you can take a call and say that there is a fund with a track record operating the same segment that an NFO is going to operate, right? Should I put in a new untested fund manager in that segment or should I go behind this? I would suggest that you take the advice of uh, an advisor or a, or a mutual fund distributor on this strategy. But my broad thing I would say is that NFOs are very flavor of the period. And hence, if you say that, okay, apply for an NFO, then I would say apply one rule, right? It's really thematic. Money triples, exit. So 10 rupees become 30 rupees, you exit, redeploy it in a tested mutual fund. Um, so we've received some appreciation from a retiree. If I could just take a moment to share it. I, I don't think this is appropriate for that, Shweta. Oh, yes. uh, let's keep this to questions. Uh, sure. I don't want, uh, we, I thank, please send, thank that person for the appreciation and uh, uh, leave it at that. I sure. think we, that, uh, we let's that, focus sir. on uh, questions for people. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question, sir. Which sector, according to you, is most beneficial for investment? Could you please recommend some good company to invest at present? So answering from the reverse, uh, I cannot recommend a company. Uh, SEBI regulations do not permit us to comment on specific stocks or companies. So my apologies for that. On which sectors, I would say is that uh, it's essentially linked to your risk appetite and your time frame. Right? So if you are a, a moderate risk appetite, then I would suggest that IT sector is a good uh, sectoral investment because of the fact that these companies are well-researched, well-available, not many negative surprises. Plus, in a recovering world, uh, the uh, demand for IT products post-pandemic will boom. They will benefit. A weaker rupee, which is what I spoke about, will also benefit. So IT sector, is, to some extent, is a good, uh, more safer option. The second, a little more safer option would be the banking and financial services, BFSI, as it's called, where you have public sector banks, private sector banks, private NBFCs, uh, asset management companies, insurance companies. It's fairly diversified sector base, where this is in a fairly sweet spot because they have been uh, hurt in terms of stock price appreciation by the uncertainty around the pandemic and NPAs and, and the, the capitalization requirement of public sector. But I think over the medium term, if you're a believer in Indian economic recovery, banks have been sitting on a load of cash. Credit deposit ratios are down. Deposit rates are down. So they have lots of money at a very, very, uh, very appropriate cost so that when they start lending, they'll make good profits. Their net interest margins can widen. So I would say banking BFSI as a sector is also something that a moderate risk investor can look at it from that perspective. So if you are uh, more aggressive in your risk approach and you have a longer time frame in mind, then I would suggest that the infrastructure sector is a very good sector because India's story of growth is first going to be driven by a manufacturing cycle and subsequently by the broader consumption cycle. So I would say that uh, infrastructure, which is where manufacturing companies will all feature in it, would be a very good pick from an aggressive investor with a long-term approach, right? At the same time, Right. Uh, consumption is a very uh, uh, sector, but bear in mind that there are two types of consumption companies. There are the low risk, more stable return, FSCG or consumer staples as they call it. And then there is a higher risk consumer discretionary uh, like refrigerators, air conditioners or automobiles, you know, that segment. So consumption is a balanced approach. So if you choose a consumption fund, it's going to be 
partly defensive partly aggressive so choose that with care you saw a little bit of a study in terms of that consumption fund how much it has towards the cyclical discretionary versus stable uh, staples is something you have to do some research before you enter into it uh, what other sectoral funds are available? There's the pharma and healthcare sector, which has seen a lot of rise and a lot of support due to the pandemic and the increased demand for pharma and healthcare. But over a longer term, the pluses for pharma are that probably there's a fundamental reset in terms of medical costs and people willing to insure, which is a big boost for the pharma and the hospitals and other business. Second is a weakening rupee will again be a supportive to an export-oriented pharma sector. But at the same time, uh, prices of drugs are always under challenge on controls. Now also people are saying, why don't you give the corona vaccine free? Why don't you reduce the cost of medicines? So I think the their margins and this will constantly be subject of debate. So there will be some volatility because of that. So choose that sector with, with, with care. So I hope as a conservative investor, I would suggest you completely stay away from a sectoral investment. So next question, sir. What is the kind of return one can expect from the Sundaram Services Fund in the next 15 to 20 years? Uh, in a 15 to 20 year time frame, I would say 15 to 18 percent return uh, from a services sector should not be uh, difficult to achieve. Per annum. Uh, next question, sir. Can we invest in small cap funds for five to seven years and can we do a lump sum? Uh, I would say that, uh, yes, if you clearly specified the five to seven years, yes, you can invest in small caps. So you have a five to seven year perspective and yes, you can put lump sum. There's no need to stagger your investment or as I was normally suggesting for a small cap. If you have a five to seven year, you have the money, you can put it in now. Be prepared that it'll be voluntary. Your NAV may come down, but just stick through that period because five to seven years later, you will get very good returns from that fund. The next question, sir. Do you think bad banks will help PSU banks do well in the next few years? Uh, not necessarily. There is a cost to the bad bank. There's too much hype around this bad bank situation. Bear in mind, nobody's picking up the losses of the NPAs, right? So when the bad bank is created, the publicity of banks have to take an equity stake in it. And effectively, what they're doing is the management of an NPA portfolio is being outsourced to the bad bank. The losses will be the... Uh, coming to the owner bank only. You can't make a bad decision and say this bad bank will take it. Who will put money into that? So they only have to put money into that and then try to sell the recovery prospects to potential investors and all of that, right? They are by trying to reduce the loss that they will suffer on their back, but it frees up management time because a normal manager has to go chase NPAs to this recovery and all of that. He will now focus on lending and deposit mobilization and all of that. So their performance will definitely improve on an operational level. Their resources will be released, but do not expect that it's a cost-free environment. There's a cost to pay for the bad decisions made on NPAs, which they have to absorb. So bad bank doesn't wish away that bad news. Next question, sir. Do you think for the future of Indian economy, there should be a revolution in the automobile sector? Like Ola has been in process to introduce electronic vehicles. Uh, what is the, uh, there should be what? I missed the... A revolution in the automobile sector. So I think a revolution in the auto sector is inevitable. It is not necessary for the growth of the economy. I think it's because uh, India has already clearly stated from a green uh, uh, ambitions perspective, we want to be at the leadership of the reducing fuel emissions, reducing cost, and obviously electric uh, transformation. I don't want to say electrification. That's not the right word. Electric transformation of the auto industry is definitely, uh, you've heard Mr. Gadkari speak about it, about deadlines on 2030 for all of these uh, solar powered or electric powered vehicles. So definitely that transformation is there, but it's not a growth oriented driven transformation. Please bear in mind. It's a more of concern for the environment, concern for the sustainability of our world that we want to be leaders in that space and go that way. So it is not necessarily linked to growth because I don't see fundamentally uh, that many passengers, if you offer a cheaper normal car and a costlier electric or solar powered car, choosing the uh, costlier electric power, there will be a proportion of population who feel responsible and will do it. But will that be the entire mass? No, why should I end up spending another 10,000 rupees on my EMI just for this? So it will take time. There will be a rating of cars, like in air conditioners, your five-star rated versus other rated based on their impact on the environment. There will be grading and rating. But definitely the drive 
towards that is inevitable the world over and what is also driving this is that a lot of these esg kind of funds right will not invest in a conventional auto company so they will see some dry up of liquidity from investors because increasingly provident funds and others worldwide are saying that i want to make socially responsible investing so it's a gradual process so money will flow will only go to these kind of money they will get a better so it will support the market growth the other aspect here is that in the process of this revolutionizing or transformation there will be a gdp positive impact coming from the creed for creating new capacities new type of machinery new type of things so lot of supplies and goods so yes there could be a revolution along the supply to electrically uh, driven cars which will create its own capex and certain uh, you know business for a lot of uh, mid and small cap companies so yes uh, i think that uh indian economy will benefit from this and it is also a strategic decision of the government to do this but that is the sole driver of the economic growth of the country i don't think so but definitely it will boost the economic growth of this correct the next question sir what kind of returns can we expect from it stocks well uh, you know it stocks will give you stable returns when i say stable returns it's on about the nominal gdp of the country so whatever the gdp projections of the country plus the inflationary projections as they vary from year to year i would say maybe 100 basis points more than that because it is a well researched well information supplied industry so their future is good but that good future is also known to a lot more people so their valuations have risen so expect a decent stable nominal growth of the country oriented return from it sector the next one sir uh what is the growth rate of sundaram mutual fund as a fund house well i think that uh, you know we have grown from what 2500 crores a year when i joined this company 17 years ago to 45000 crores now so i would say definitely we've been growing at a 20% plus cagr over this period the uh, next one sir i am invested in 2000 since 2018 in emerging small cap fund which is close ended when can i withdraw from this fund and put it into blue chip fund and when can i fully cash out well only on the maturity date there is no option to do that though technically it's listed at the stock exchange if you can find a friend or somebody else who's willing to buy it on the stock exchange you can sell it there but as far as the mutual fund house is concerned the money will be paid to you only on the due date i don't know which small cap series when it is maturing you can only take it on the maturity date so if you have invested in the dividend option we are trying to uh, pay out as much dividends as possible that can be taken and put in the blue chip fund as and when you receive the dividend but in the growth option only on maturity date uh, which should be available uh, you know with the customer service or registrar or with your initial investment uh, uh, form with such so next question sir as you advise global investments should it be through staggered manner within the next 12 to 18 months not necessary i think they in global you can put lump sum because i expect uh, tapering to give a strong uh, reaction so whereby the rupee will devalue so that will immediately give you a positive return to your global portfolio number one short term second is because tapering is occurring it means that recovery in the us and the worldwide is on a good uptick so those markets will start showing uptick which will do so rather than stagger it in global i would say you can put a lump sum in global today the only reason to put staggered global is if you are planning for a longer term foreign expenditure like sending your son abroad for uh, education or you want to take uh, a cruise on your say silver jubilee wedding anniversary the worldwide so you want to plan for that then an sip route over the 5 5 years or 10 years in a global fund will help you protect yourself against currency devaluation which otherwise would hurt your savings made in india but to be spent in dollars as the case thank you sir um we received uh, more questions than we can answer so in the interest of time we'll just take another two questions and then close sure sure i think um the next one sir uh, as far as returns are concerned is there any big difference in returns when the amount is invested directly through an agency directly or through an agency so uh okay so an agency generally gets about 1 to 1 and 1/2% commission uh, 
uh, for your investment, which you can save by going direct. But when you look at the fact that over the long term, the stock markets are expected to deliver nominal GDP plus say 200 basis points. When you take the long-term growth of uh, the Sensex or the Nifty or anything, it's generally been about 14, 15%, right? So fund managers have consistently over a longer term period delivered two to three percent, so 17, 18% returns issues assume. So the point is that the extra returns that you get because you choose the right funds to the help of an advisor should more than compensate this one to one and a half percent commission that you are paying to an agency. So I would say that the route to go through an agency, whether it's a registered investment advisor or a mutual fund distributor, there are two categories, right? Will in the long run protect you from the downsides of the market by doing proper asset allocation and at the same time help you with your goal planning and effort. So there is some time and effort at your end involved, which is being done by the agency. I would say on the uh, uh, thing that the agency will always uh, be able to deliver that value to you in the long term. And you have the freedom that if an agency is not living up to the expectations to change the agency. But these agencies are spending their time, energy and resources in researching, in getting qualifications like certified financial planner and helping you in a scientific way to plan for your future expense, future expenses, right? So I would say always in, in that sense of the view, right? In the, if you are in a normal work environment, your job is something else. It's not the stock market. Then that spending that extra time to research the topic will come at the cost of something, either your leisure time or your work time, right? So I would say focus on that because that will improve your earnings and your quality of life and leave the investment decision to professionals and paying them a little bit, maximum of 100 to 150 basis points uh, is, I would say, will prove to be worth it in the longer run. Um, the last one, sir. Gold prices are down. Is it a good idea to invest in gold ETFs? Will the returns be equal to an equity fund? So, uh, gold is a, is, a, is a net residual asset class. What do I mean by that? It always comes up when there is hyperinflation, there is threat of war, there is deep recession. Whenever there is some very bad news around the world around these times is when it's a it's a, somewhere people go to for safety and they park their money, right? One another reason why gold goes up is because uh, central banks of the world, central government, ba banks of the countries, right? Uh, their surpluses, they generally park it in gold or in US dollar. So what happens is these are huge amounts of money that they move, right? So when the dollar is weakening, these countries tend to put it in gold because the depreciation dollar will reduce the value of their investments. But when the dollar is strengthening, they would rather put money into dollars and pull it out from gold. So the risk that I mentioned during the course of the question are that of a US economy recovery and a dollar strengthening will make a lot of central governments uh, to shift their gold holdings into dollar holdings, treasury bills, right? That will make sure that then the gold prices don't rise too much. So today, unless the situation of the US economy, you get bad news around a fourth wave of the pandemic, and then the US economy is going to go into another recession, then gold will step in and show you know, its value. But that apart, today the news flow around the world is that the vaccines have helped the world manage the corona pandemic well, cures are along the way, economies are recovering, and lockdowns are being opened up. Such a scenario, it's a matter of time before the dollar starts to strengthen and reflect this strength, in which case then gold will be inferior in terms of that investment. So I would suggest that you keep track of the economic growth of US, you take the fact of whether Fed is going to taper, and those are the times that you will find that the gold will not appreciate that much because alternative asset classes will be much more attractive to big investors. So track that. So on the whole, I do expect a dollar to strengthen and the US economy to recover over the next few months. So in that perspective, I would not be putting a major amount of my money into gold, right? That being said, always a five to 10% allocation to gold as a hedge against unexpected risk like Corona. 
is something that you should keep as part of your asset allocation. Thank you, sir. Um, participants, thank you for your questions uh, and the overwhelming response. Uh, for the questions we haven't answered, we leave uh, answers in the comments or we'll take a few in the next Q&A session. Thank you and wish you all the best to stay safe through this pandemic.